I thought it might be useful to present uh, as a video the, the lecture that I had planned to give at the Kiev conference, which sadly we had to, to postpone. Now I'll just get it into slideshow and then we'll, uh, we'll get started. There. Now, um, I, I plan to talk about low-grade sweat gland carcinomas, and, and there's, there's a good reason for this. In the, in the old days, uh, uh, one of our main issues was trying to determine whether a tumor was eccrine or of apocrine derivation. And over the years, it's become obvious that that's rather a futile exercise, and it's of no great value to anybody whether the tumor derives from or differentiates towards an eccrine or an apoeccrine or uh, even a mammary gland like anogenital sweat gland tumor. The important thing really is to decide whether a tumor is benign or malignant and at the top we have a poroma and at the bottom down here we have ductal differentiation and a malignant eccrine poroma so there's the benign at the top the malignant at the bottom now if we look at a skin tumor and we decide it's it's a carcinoma and uh, it looks glandular well then the issue really is deciding whether this glandular tumor is a primary lesion arising in the skin or a metastasis. So those are the first steps. Benign versus malignant. If it's malignant, is it a primary or is it a metastasis? And if you follow that line, you're halfway there to getting to the final diagnosis. So it's very important that you have some clinical information because if the clinician can tell you that the patient has an adenocarcinoma in his GIT or his stomach or it's a lady and she has breast cancer and that this is probably a metastasis, well, half of the job, in fact, three quarters of the job is done for you. So it's important to always get the clinical information too. Now, let's say we have a, we've determined that the tumor is arising primarily in the skin and it's malignant. Well, then we can do, uh, we can make two subdivisions which are meaningful. We can either grit classify the tumor as a low-grade malignant sweat gland carcinoma, which is one that recurs but hardly ever metastasizes, or we can classify it as a high-grade sweat gland carcinoma, which commonly recurs and has a significant or even high uh, level of metastasis. Now at the top here we have a nice high power view of an adenoid cystic carcinoma which I'm going to talk about a bit later on and at the bottom I borrowed this article from uh, Kim and co workers showing PET scan and CT imaging uh, of metastases that derive from a sweat gland carcinoma arising in the scrotum. So um, that's a that anyway summarizes the starting point. Now, um, this is a list of all of the low-grade sweat gland carcinomas that I can think of. And I'm going to talk particularly about microcystic adnexal carcinoma, which includes solid carcinoma and eccrine epithelioma, and I'm also going to talk about adenoid cystic and secretory carcinoma. I, and I briefly touch on apocrine cribriform carcinoma. I won't be discussing neuroendocrine mucinous and polymorphous sweat gland carcinoma. I'll leave that for another day. 
And this is a very nice example of secretory carcinoma. And I'll discuss the immunohistochemistry of this tumor a little bit later on. So let's start with microcystic adnexal carcinoma. Now, in my experience, th this is probably one of the tumors that I've seen most often in, in, in my time. And this may be referral bias. Uh, the two tumors really are microcystic adnexal and mucinous carcinoma. And I'm not sure really which I've seen most are probably microcystic adnexal. But if you look up here to the top, the incidence at its very worst is 0.65 per million. So it means in the real world it's desperately rare. And uh, there's not much to say about it in terms of demographic. You can get it at any age, really. The youngest that I came across was six years of age. Now, it's a tumor of Caucasians, and um, you do very, very occasionally see it in patients of different, different, different uh, ethnicity. I've seen it occasionally in 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 uh, in Asian people, on one or two cases in in black populations. It's a tumor you get on the face, particularly around the nose and around the orbit, and it's a slowly growing sort of insidious tumor that that. Uh, you often don't see an awful lot. The patient can feel it, and when you look at them, you don't maybe see so much. Um, and in fact, uh, this is borne out with uh, when you come to do the excision, you often find the tumors way, way, way beyond what you can pick up clinically. But if it has uh, resulted in an obvious lesion, there are. Uh, they can be variable, but uh, a small 0.5 to 2 centimeter nodule, it may be erythematous, it may have scale on the top, uh, and sometimes rather like desmoplastic trichoepithelioma, there's a central dell or depression. Now, a minority of patients complain of pain or burning or tingling, and this is largely due to perineural infiltration, which I think is probably invariably present in this tumor. And uh, the occurrence rate ranges from 40 to 60 percent. Nowadays, people are a bit more keen on using Mohs surgery for this tumor. I'm not sure that that has much effect on the recurrence rate, but obviously it's cosmetically much more appealing. Now, there are three case reports in the literature, but I've read them, and I, I'm not desperately convinced they were ever microcystic adnexal carcinoma in the first place. So I don't really know whether it ever has truly metastasized. I did ask McKeedam some time back if anybody in the group had ever seen one, and I didn't get any any replies that said that they had. Now here are some clinical pictures. You see, there's one on the the lower eyelid, and you can see it's a little bit of an ulcerated, pearly white, thickened uh, tumor. And you can imagine how difficult that would have been to. Uh, to deal with surgically. There's a little one on the nose and on the forehead. This is a previously treated one and uh, I think the patient had radiotherapy by the looks of it and uh, those two dots are, are, are indicating I think residual recurrent tumor and there's another bit there. And this patient I remember very well. The ink around it is actually what um, was thought to be the tumor clinically. And this outer ring, which is faded, but you can sort of vaguely make it out going around there, and there's a bit more blue there. This was the, this was the size of the lesion, uh, of the 
tissue that was removed in the initial Mohs procedure. So you can see it was half as wide again. And uh, this is a picture I borrowed from from the uh, JAD. Um, and it just shows you a nice example of how microcystic adnexal carcinoma clinically may resemble a BCC with this rather nice rolled rolled margin. And here's one uh, where it presented as multi multiple nodules. There's half a dozen of them or so. And uh, this is one uh, that I got from archives of, of ophthalmology showing that's the primary tumor there. But if you look at the cavernous sinus on this side, it's it's patent, and on this side, it's completely obliterated by tumor. Now, the histology of microcystic adnexal carcinoma, um, it can be quite a difficult diagnosis. Now, in the best of days, it shows what's called zoning, and that is at the top of the tumor, you see keratocysts, and coming down uh, through the um, dermis, the keratocysts um, slowly fade away, and you get um, you get narrow epithelial strands compressed with fibrous tissue. And towards the base, you may see some ductal differentiation, and that's what it's supposed to look like, but very often it doesn't quite follow those rules. But the important thing is the keratocysts are formed by uh, 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 infundibular keratinization, so they have a granular cell there. They don't show, well, they don't generally show pilar differentiation, but I think you could sometimes get a mixture of the two. And the tumor is thought to be differentiating towards anything that you may see in the in the pilosebaceous follicles. So it may show uh, uh, hair differentiation, which we'll get back to, ductal differentiation, and even, even sebaceous differentiation, although I've not seen that myself. Uh, because it's the differentiating towards the outer root sheath, you can often see clear cell change. And I mentioned, I mentioned that this perineural infiltration, and I was saying it's always there. And if you don't see it, do an S100, and that will help you pick it up. Now, I'll come back to the solid variant, which is classified currently as a variant of microcystic adnexal carcinoma. Now, I have to be honest with you, I have no idea whether it really belongs there or whether it's a separate tumor, but um, I'm going along with the current classification, so I'll leave it alone. And there's, there's what I'm sort of talking about. There, as you see, this is the top of the tumor. And it's showing nice epidermoid keratinization uh, with nice lamellae of, of keratin. And there is clear cell change. And um, there is the deep aspect where you can see these narrow epithelial strands in a dense fibrous stroma. And here, here we see at the bottom left the tumors extended into the uh, skeletal muscle. And there's beautiful ductal differentiation, which sometimes is just really intracytoplasmic lumina. And this is the solid variant, and I'll come back to that later, later on. And there are a few more views, again, showing clear cell change. And there's intraneural as well as perineural infiltration. Now, this is a variant that's sometimes known as ectrine epithelioma, in which you don't see the keratocysts. And the importance of ectrine epithelioma is you might be mistaking it for a morpheiform BCC. But in my experience, at least in morpheiform BCC, you do see residual, more recognizable basal cell carcinoma somewhere in the tumor. And again, you see the ductal differentiation, and here's 
uh, perineural in infiltration. Now, this is a lovely case that Dr. Mauro Rabar uh, posted on the Kiko platform and very kindly allowed me to show it because it, it really is splendid. It shows all the features very nicely. There's the, there's the low power view, and you can see the lesions extending right down to subcutaneous fat. And at a slightly, whoops. At a slightly higher magnification, you can see keratosis <clears throat> on the right-hand side. And there's, there's a, another view there showing skeletal muscle in, in, involvement. And here are some different magnifications. There, is a, there are the keratocysts. There's proper glandular differentiation. So we're not, in this tumor, relying solely on intracytoplasmic lumina. And there are the narrow epithelial strands, and there's the dense fibrous stroma. And uh, involvement of the skeletal muscle that we saw at low power. Now, this is really awfully impressive. If you look at the bottom of the top of the bottom left uh, image, you can see a nerve totally surrounded by tumor, and on the bottom right, there's a high power view showing perineural infiltration involving that nerve, and it's completely surrounding that nerve. And that, of course, is one of the reasons why this tumor is so difficult to treat, because you, you excise the tumor and you think it's, it's fine, but what you don't realize is it, it sneaked away up a nerve somewhere out of sight, and you don't see that in the specimen, and then it comes back. In fact, I think, uh, I think there's a case report in the literature where, in fact, the a microcystic adnexal carcinoma followed, I think it was the trigeminal or facial nerves, and it ended up with... Uh, 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 carcinoma, which is infiltration in the meninges at the base of the brain. So that gives you an idea of how horrible this tumor can be. So although we call it low grade, the low grade applies to the metastasis, not to the what the tumor can actually do. And everybody likes immunohistochemistry, and uh, I, I have to put it in. But to be honest with you, the only thing I use or I used to use, was EMA and CEA and S100, the EMA and CEA to pick up the ducts, as you see on the right. I've mentioned the S100. I suppose if you're wondering about a desmoplastic trichoepithelioma or, or a, a, a sort of a more fear form BCC showing ductal differentiation, then Burr EP. Four would be ne would be useful as it's negative in Mac. I I I can't comment on all these keratins because I've never used them. Uh, one of the things I forgot to mention is you tend not to see any mitotic activity in a Mac, and this goes along with low key sixty seven expression. And um. Some workers, as I mentioned, think that the recurrence can be greatly reduced with Mohs surgery. And I'm a great fan of Mohs surgery for Max, largely because of the cosmetic uh, benefits of the surgery. There have been some reports comparing Mohs versus plastic surgery in terms of recurrence, and there wasn't there wasn't that that much to uh, to choose between them. I've never seen Mac in a lymph node either, and I've mentioned I don't believe these systemic spread. The one thing I think is important is you should not use radiotherapy in this tumor, because if you do, you'll convert all of the stroma into something that's even more dense, and when it recurs, you'll not be able to use surgery as a, as a means of treatment. Now, we've got this solid variant that I mentioned to you, and um, it's one that's described mostly on the scalp, and it's a tumor where you don't see the keratocysts. 
uh, but you can find ductal differentiation. And the tumor islands are rather like the solid, the solid nest you can sometimes see in a more obvious Mac. So this is, this is one here that Antonina Kalmakova shared with me. And I have to give her great credit because she made the diagnosis. I, I, I got stuck on this thinking it was a, a trichoblastic carcinoma. And uh, I'm not sure whether Antonina's right or I'm right, but at the end of the day, I went along with Antonina, and I'll show you why I did. So there is this great chunk of tissue with lots of tumor stuffed all over the place. And if we look at it in closer view, those are the, you see those nests of cells that they're presenting as balls of cells, and that's really really, um, really uh, uh, what you tend to see in, in MAC. Um, unfortunately, I, I haven't labeled these and I've forgotten what these are and I'm not going to do this video all over again, so I'm going to ignore them. Uh, so let's, let's now go back to microcystic next and our carcinoma with differential. Well, the tumors that I think uh, it mostly resembles or mostly can be confused with, number one would be desmoplastic trichoepithelioma. And if you get a superficial biopsy of a MAC, they can be indistinguishable on light microscopy, microscopy because you don't always see ductal differentiation in the superficial part of a MAC. The other problem is that my desmoplastic trichoepithelioma has a high recurrence rate. It recurs in about 40% of patients, so that can confuse you as well. So you do need to have a decent biopsy to be able to tell the difference. But the one thing that I can tell you is this. You do not get ductal differentiation in desmoplastic trichoepithelioma. So if you're thinking about that, do an EMA and a CEA. If you find ductal differentiation, then you're looking at a MAC. It's as simple as that. But uh, I, I must say in the past, I have multiple times I've told the surgeon that they've got to re-excise and get the whole thing out because I can't tell which it is. Um, so that's one. Trichoadenoma, where you get lots of mini epidermoid cysts uh, as a superficial tumor in the dermis, we often talk about that, but it's not really a differentiate at, at all. Squamid equine ductal carcinoma I'll come to, and desmoplastic squamous carcinoma is included in the differential, but it's, I don't know, I don't really see that you're going to make a, make a mistake on that. Um, syringoma, I, I, I don't get it. Now, there was an entity described as squamous cell carcinoma with MAC-like differentiation, uh, and I, I don't understand what that is. I'm, I'm not going to mention the authors because it's, uh, it's a controversial topic. And if you're interested, look it up and you'll find it in the literature and you'll see what you make of it. The books talk about adenoid cystic as a differential. I, I think that's nonsense. Adenoid cystic carcinoma look, looks totally different and is easily recognized. Now here's the squamous eccrine ductal carcinoma, and th this is an important tumor. It's what in the old days we used to call adenosquamous carcinoma, and it occurs on some damaged skin of the elderly. And uh, um, it, its importance is because it has a metastasis rate of 13%, although uh, in this series of 20 cases, only one was associated with distant metastases, but they look quite different. But that's a lovely clinical that I borrowed, uh, as you see. And um, what does it look like? Well, the top bit looks like squamous carcinoma, and the bottom bit looks, looks like an adenocarcinoma. It's as easy as that. 
It's very pleomorphic and there's loads of mitosis, so it's obviously malignant. That's the important thing. It's obviously malignant. Um, and it has a desnoplastic stroma. And as I mentioned, obviously CEA and EMA will be positive. So um, let's have a look at some more of these. Uh, this is one, I, I think Thomas Bren shared this one with me. And this is the superficial part that's looking squamous. And there's the uh, deep part showing ductal differentiation. And this is the case that uh, Dr. Cecilia Rosales shared with me. And it's a super case. She, she, uh, she, uh, she also posted it on Facebook, I think. And it's a really tricky tumour because uh, I'm not sure where this fits in the overall scheme of things. But this is a tumour that shows keratosis at the top. So it looks a bit Mac-like. And if we look in this field, it looks Mac-like. And they, there's your narrow epithelial strand. So at the moment, you would be thinking this looks like a microcystic adnexal carcinoma. Uh, and there's a close-up view showing the squamous component, showing the, um, the narrow epithelial strands. But then at the bottom of the tumor, it looks like this, which is more like a carcinoma. I, I I ended up not being able to classify this tumour. I've never seen anything quite like it before. It's not microcystic and nexal carcinoma, and it's not a, a, an adenosquamous carcinoma. It's more like a mac with a, a, a gland in a bit that's gone really haywire. So I think that's a, that's a pretty unique case, and maybe we'll see more in the years to come, and we'll know a bit more what to do with it. There's some close-up view there. You see, this is not extraordinary. It's a really fascinating tumor. Now, I thought I'd touch on adenoid cystic carcinoma. Um, now, this is this is one of the few low-grade sweat gland carcinomas. That in, in that can that can metastasize, and it makes me a bit, a bit concerned that I even include it in this group. But I suppose it's because the metastases are very rare. I have seen, I think I've seen perhaps two cases of ad, of primary cutaneous adenoid cystic carcinoma with metastases. One of them I do remember well, and that patient had widespread metastases in lungs and bone marrow. The other one, I think, only went to lymph nodes. And this is one that Dr. Singh published in the Egyptian Journal of Cancer. And there's the primary tumor on the lip. And there are subpleural metastases uh, involving both sides of the chest. Um, they're not particularly, uh, there's nothing um, about them clinically that would make you think of an adenoid cystic necessarily. Like MAC, they can give you pain and tingling and so on. And most of the tumors occur on the scalp. And to my, in my experience on the face, you don't see them on the limbs, which I suppose is is interesting. And uh, so let's let's have a look at the uh, immuno or at the histology. And this top picture is from a case that uh, Professor Matthias Bobos very kindly shared with me, and I'll show you some more pictures from that in a minute or two. There's a lovely field. We we talk about the cribriform growth pattern. And that's typical crib reform growth pattern there. And that's a PAS, just to show you that the luminal contents are PAS positive. Now, adenoid cystic is a biphasic tumor. So it, it, and in, and in addition to showing epithelial cells, it also shows myoepithelial cells. So this is a tumor where P63 calponin and smooth muscle actin will be positive. And that's, that's quite interesting to see a tumor expressing both, both parts of the sweat duct. 
And as I meant, this is another one that always shows perineural infiltration. You've got to look for it. And uh, it is also associated with basement membrane reduplication. And you can pick this up on H&E, but if you want to, lamin and type 4 collagen are very pretty. And about 60% of primary cutaneous tumors are associated with MYB chromosomal abnormalities, uh, 60%. So that's interesting. And this is another one from... Matthias's case, there's beautiful cribriform pattern, and look at that. There's a there's a nerve with with both perineural infiltration and intraneural growth. That's a really beautiful picture, and thank you, Matt, Matthias, for sharing it with me. And there's a there's another field there. This is a case of of mine from years gone by, and that's. That's basement membrane reduplication. I think we used lamin in our type 4 collagen. I've forgotten which. And um, we've seen these two images before. And there is the, um, the uh, myoepithelial component with P63. And it, you can see the CCD11 expression in the tumor. I'm not sure what, the, what that's supposed to tell you, but... There you go, there it is. Uh, isn't that pretty? That's from Matthias's case. And there's uh, PCA, PCEA. Um, to be honest with you, the immunohistochemistry is very pretty, but you should be able to pick up an adenocystic carcinoma pretty easily. And the only issue really is whether it's arising in the skin or whether it's a salivary gland tumor growing up into the skin, or I suppose very exceptionally, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen it, but uh, I, I would think metastatic adenocystic carcinoma would be in the differential at least. And here's a case that Dr. Chi Shun Yang sh shared with me. Uh, and again, it's typical adenocystic. But this was rather pretty immunohistochemistry showing you the biphasic niche with the myoepithelial cells. And lastly, primary cutaneous secretory carcinoma. This one shared with me uh, by Dr. Grishikov from Moscow. And this is a lovely case. It's very exciting. Uh, it's a very beautiful tumor. And when, I think when you've seen one uh, it's not that difficult to recognize. So this patient presented with a nodule over the left hip. And there are some close-up views. And look at that. Isn't it gorgeous? All those secretions. So it, it's bubbling all over the place. But it's not bubbly cytoplasm. It's bubbly secretions. I don't think anything else really looks like that. So... Um, it should be it should be something that that you pick up. You see, there is there's the high power there, isn't that beautiful? And here we can see uh, some ductal differentiation at the edge, uh, and there are some ducts there as well. And uh, the other name for cutaneous um, secretory carcinoma is it's cutaneous mammary analog secretory carcinoma and the importance of that is it's very very uh one particularly must must make sure that the, what we're looking at the skin is not a metastasis from a breast or salivary gland primary and that's really the 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 uh, the message that one should take home when one's looking at what one thinks is a cutaneous secretory carcinoma. They they may arise on they're common in the axilla, but then of course you've really you're really stuck with is this really a uh, is this really a sweat gland tumor at all, or is it a, a breast cancer arising in in the axillary tail, and uh, that can be a, a real problem. And 75% 70, 75 of the cutaneous ones that have been described show, uh, when we, sorry, I go back, 
show this T1215 uh, 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 translocation. 75% of cases show that. And uh, so th th those ones will, will be NTRK3 positive. The, one, the other 25% are negative. Um, this is important. You don't see perineural infiltration or lymphovascular invasion or necrosis and cutaneous lesions. Uh, and then you've got all this immunohistochemistry that you can play with and, and uh, see, see, see whether, whether it's any use to you or, or, or not. I, I personally... Um, gosh, I think my mind would be much more concerned with making sure I'm not missing a breast or a salivary gland tumor, to be honest with you. And there's a lovely one there. Um, th th this, is the, this is the immunohistochemistry of the uh, hip tumor, S100, P sixty three is is positive, so uh, and uh, so one's picking up a myoepithelial cell there. CD one one seven is positive. They're harder to see, but these are the red cells, and this tumor is P fifty three positive. Perhaps that's uh, uh, in indicating. Um, some element of UV exposure in the pathogenesis of that particular tumor. I don't know, but it's a thought. And here's a lovely one that Muammar Arida shared oh, a long time ago in R, but just to show that it shows exactly the same features, and it's very pretty. And there's the immunohistochemistry, CEA positive, EMA positive, P63. And here's another one uh, from uh, Paolo uh, Hernani, uh, and this was this this was an auxiliary tumor, and of course there you have the problem: is this is this from the breast or not? Now there's an apocrine gland there, and I was sort of thinking this probably represents in situ tumor, but gosh, I wouldn't like to place a, a bet on it, maybe there and there also. I don't have high power views, unfortunately, of that. But, uh, but aside from that, it looks just the same. And the, so the differential diagnosis, this is what really matters, this top one. Uh, now, a thyroid carcinoma can sometimes look like a, a, a secretory carcinoma, but TFFF1 negativity would get rid of that. I don't think these really belong in a differential diagnosis, but that, well, that's what the books say, so I put it in. That, you see, that, that's a primary cutaneous uh, um, apocrine carcinoma. Uh, and that's uh, that's the adenoid cystic. And then the very last entity I forgot about this is primary cutaneous apocrine, apocrine cribriform carcinoma. Now this this tumor uh, does not show metastases, and and some authors uh, query whether it's a carcinoma or not. Uh, I don't have any great feelings on the matter. Um, and sometimes it's called solid cribriform carcinoma. And we'll get back to that in, in a moment in the differential diagnosis. But anyway, um, th these are awfully rare. I've, I've only managed to pick up a couple of them. And this is one that Dr. Uh, Professor Chi Shun Yang very kindly shared uh, with us. And the clue or it is said to be the clue, uh, 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 an apocrine looking tumor with dense lymphoid infiltrates. Now, I don't know about these lymphoid infiltrates because I don't have enough experience, but this case certainly showed it and the literature emphasizes this. So I'm gonna make that a, an important topic. And basically you get a mixture of cribriform tubular 
papillary patterns, the papillae may join, so you, you get bridging and you can get solid nests, and they show decapitation secretion, telling us they are apocrine. Uh, and uh, contrary to the previous tumors, they're not biphasic, so there's no myoepithelial cell there. Now there's there's this case, and you can see it's a well, it looks like an apocrine carcinoma, even at this magnification. Um, and if we look around, you can see that it's it's cribriform. That there's a hint that, that it probably is uh, trying to show decapitation secretion. There are little, little papillae, and, um, well, that's about the height of it. It's not pleomorphic, and it's not mitosing, really, to any significant degree. And, uh, well, you all love immunohistochemistry, so here are all of the uh, things you might do. Um, what, what would I do with it? I think probably the most useful thing is GATA3, because uh, if it's negative, you've excluded, or you've pretty well excluded a brass carcinoma. And... Uh, EMA and CEA will help uh, pick up the glandular differentiation, but I mean, it's so obvious, why would you do that in the first place? I, I, I just don't think, see myself needing to do any of that a lot. I'm much more concerned as to whether it's primary or secondary. And this is one that Eduardo Kalonji uh, shared with me. Again, it looks like an apocrine carcinoma, but it's not desperately pleomorphic. And there's a, there's a lovely uh, cribriform field field there, and that's EMA. So um, this is this is the message I want to give to you really at the end of this all is do you really need as much, do you need all that immunohistochemistry if you're trying to make a diagnosis? What I think is simply this, if you don't know what it is to start with, you won't know what immunohistochemistry to use in the first place. And if you use, if you don't know what it is and you use all the immunohistochemistry in the world, then you end up trying to sort of picture match what it might be uh, using using some sort of algorithm. I just find that totally unhelpful. Uh, maybe I'm just too old-fashioned, but to me, if I can't tell what it is on H&E, well, then I, I sort of feel I might as well give up. And then lastly, I, I couldn't resist putting that, that in. It's such a beautiful uh, picture of a couple of rhinos that we saw in uh, the Pilanesburg Game Reserve in South Africa. And they've got nothing to do with sweat gland tumors at all. But I thought if you've listened to this blessed lecture, there had to be a silver lining somewhere. And this is it. So I hope you've enjoyed this. It's a bit, it's been a bit waffly, but uh, there are some good messages if you, if you look for them. So thank you very much for your attention.